Hi, this is Mark Wade, writer of Amazing Spider-Man Family Business, and you're listening to The Amazing Spider Talk. Too many who know the angles, uncover and untangle All the questions and the webs left out to tangle I'll be in 1962, last Wednesday's afternoon They'll bend your ears with reckless self-abandon The Amazing Spider-Talk The Amazing Spider-Talk Come swing through the air Sit back and prepare For the Amazing Spider-Talk Hello! I'm Dapper Dan Gavostin, and I'm the founder and editor of AmazingSpiderTalk.com. And I'm mischievous Mark Chinacchio, founder of the Chasing Amazing blog and author of 100 Things Spider-Man Fans Should Know and Do Before They Die. Well, thanks everyone for joining us for episode 11 of the second season of the all-new Amazing Spider Talk. We hope you enjoy this podcast and that it provides an intelligent conversation between two fans and a creator as we look at the Spider-Man comic universe in a bit of a bigger picture. Yes, in this second season of the all-new Amazing Spider-Talk, we've been taking a look at how Spider-Man hit the big time during the Stan Lee and John Romita senior run on the book in the 1960s. Well, on this episode, we're actually going to be talking about uh, the controversial reveal of Peter Parker's parents' history as Super Spies in uh, 1968's Amazing Spider-Man Annual, Volume 1, Number 5. So, Dan, you know, to help us with this episode, we're going to actually be joined by a very special guest. I mean, he, he is a comic book royalty in a lot of ways. He's a writer best known for his work, first of all, at DC, writing The Flash, Kingdom Come, Superman Birthright, but um, more in line with our topic of conversation over at the, uh, the Merry House of Ideas, he is the Eisner Award-winning writer of Daredevil, uh, also a writer of Fantastic Four, Captain America, The Avengers, The Champions, Amazing Spider-Man during the Brand New Day era, and, and most aligned with our interest, the graphic novel uh, from, uh, what was it, 2014, Spider-Man Family Business, which saw the character dealing with his parents' legacy and introduced Teresa Parker into the world of Spider-Man. It's going to be Mark Wade. I'm so excited about this interview, Mark, mainly because we're going to have another Mark on the show, but also secondarily because it's Mark Wade. Let me say, this, this might be the most impressive Mark we've had on the show, Dan, and I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I'll put myself down on that one, okay? <laughs> we've opened ourselves up for the opportunity to have more impressive Dans on the show, but we can't quite nail it. No, not yet. Anyway. (laughs) Uh, Well, you know, secondarily, this episode wouldn't be possible without support from our wonderful Patreon subscribers, whose patronage allows us to assemble the guests like Mark Wade on our show and do all of the research that it takes to kind of produce all this stuff. If you enjoy the show and you want to help us to continue while getting amazing bonus content and additional episodes that we never release publicly, like one we did last week for our last episode of the show, please go to our show notes and check out our Patreon page. Click on that big old button and consider joining our team. Hey, Dan, I, I, I did just realize as you were saying that we did have Mark Guggenheim on this show, but that's Mark with a C. Yeah, so that doesn't count. That doesn't count. That's he true. Is the most impressive. He was the most impressive Mark with a C we've had that on. <laughs> but now we've had the most impressive Mark with a K. OK. All right. All right. I'll, uh, that's fair. That's fair. I just didn't want to offend Mark Guggenheim, Dan. OK, <laughs> no, that's totally fair. On another special note, people who keep up with our show or keep count We'll notice that we're rapidly approaching our 200th episode at the end of August. And, um, you know, we did a 100th episode, well, nearly a 100 episodes ago. Funny that. Um, And uh, on that show, we did this awesome thing where we featured your calls and memories of the show. And we kind of wanted to do something similar again for this 200th episode alongside the content that we have planned for it, which we haven't announced yet. So, but in the meantime, we want to hear from you guys. So give us a ring at our hotline, 9 Red Goblin. Again, that's 9, and then the villain of the last arc of, of Dan Slott's run, <laughs> the Red Goblin. We'll get into whether or not we created that another time. And But if you call in 9 Red Goblin, 
You got the number? Leave us a message with your name, where you're calling from, and any memories you have of listening to the show. We'd love to know more about you in particular and what you've enjoyed in our journey from episode 100 to 200. Even if you've just been around for an episode or two, let us know about your experience listening to our show. Mark, you and I are busy putting together what I think is going to be one of our most exciting shows yet for that episode. But I know that you, our listener, your voices will really help us pull the whole thing together. Um, but this is a lot of talking and not, and not enough Mark waiting. So let's get to the action and hope you enjoy our episode entitled Secret Agent Parents. Secret agents dedicating their lives to protecting the world. Peter Parker's parents disappeared on their last mission. They left behind a son they'd never see grow up into the amazing Spider-Man. Well, Dan, not to tease our listeners, but before we get to Mark Wade, uh, just because we don't actually talk a ton about the, the comic and self in question here, I just kind of wanted to run through uh, Amazing Spider-Man Annual Number 5. Like I mentioned earlier, it, it came out in 1968. Even though we're, we're in the um, Stan Lee Ramita era, uh, Ramita actually only provided the cover art for this comic. Uh, the, the interior pencils are um, Larry Lieber, which is, was Stan's brother, and uh, Mike Esposito did the inks on it with Stan Lee doing the scripts. And, and this is the, the comic that answered the question that I guess was kind of long being... So that's the thing. It's, it, we really never... It was never really talked about in the comics prior to this. It was just, oh, here's Peter Parker with Aunt May and Uncle Ben, right? I mean, there was no... Like whatever happened to his parents? I mean, am I am I off base in this, Dan? <laughs> no, I'm sh- I'm sure people were asking that question to themselves, but you're right. The comic never really posed it. Right. So you know, Stanley decided to answer this question, even if there weren't, if he didn't necessarily ever broach it earlier, and um, they, he kind of answers it in a very uh, audacious way. I mean, it's 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 not that Peter's parents just died in a car accident or you know something kind of mundane it, it turns out that they were um spies for i don't i don't you know i i go back and forth i i, I don't think it was a technically shield um i think it's kind of like a precursor to shield at that point um i mean but in like later stories they they kind of tie it all together to shield and fury and all that kind of stuff but um peter's parents are are spies for the united states and they end up basically getting unmasked, so to speak, uh, while on a mission uh, in Algeria. And uh, the Red Skull, the arch nemesis of Captain America, ends up masterminding uh, their death in a plane crash. Um, and Peter finds this all out and even vindicates his, the, his parents because, you know, when, when he learns of their deaths, and the and the circumstances around it, it's they're actually believed to be traitors to the United States, and he's kind of able to clear their name, I guess. Um, this also features a uh, a great panel where uh, Spider Man murders a henchman of the Red Skull with a what was it like a missile gun? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, the missile is coming for him, and the comic goes out of its way to deliberately have him redirect the missile into a guy in a car that blows up. So like. You can't even have the technicality of like, well, he like the missile hit the car while chasing him. It was like, no, he did that intentionally. Exactly. So anyway, <laughs> um, the the story behind Peter's parents kind of is not touched again in the in the pages of Spider Man until like almost like thirty years later when in, during like the peak of. Well, it wasn't the Clone Saga yet. It was like pre-Clone Saga, but, you know, the peak 90s event eventisms. It was like the, part of the David Michelinie, Mark Bagley run with uh, Danny Figueroa as the editor who kind of, I think, hatched the, the idea for the most part. Uh, he brought Peter's parents back uh, that they were alive this whole time, but it turned out they were actually like androids that were 
hired by the chameleon who was being the strings were being pulled by Harry Osborne, even though Harry Osborne was dead and yada, yada, yada. <laughs> Famously on one of our earliest episodes of this show, nearly 200 episodes ago, we got Danny Fingeroth to admit that there was no plan for this. They were just going to kind of figure it out. Yes. 90s comics, kids. Like I said, it's, it's, it's certainly a controversial storyline in that I feel in a lot of ways, a lot of people don't know what to do with it. But that's why we brought Mark Wade on here because he ended up doing something with it in 2014's graphic novel, Spider-Man Family Business, or, or he at least plays within that mythology. So uh, why don't we now go to Mark and uh, hear what he's got to say. Well, now let's meet one of our amazing spider friends, the kind of guy I to other friends who recommend. Find out about the things they created. You'll love them so much that you wish you dated. But you're just friends. They're an amazing friend. A friend, a friend, a friend. They're an amazing friend. Well, welcome back, listeners. Uh, Mark and I are joined today, like we said earlier, by none other than Mark Wade. Mark, I wanted to thank you so much for joining us for, on the show. My pleasure, sir. Uh, the first thing, you know, we're, today we're talking about Peter Parker's parents and their kind of, I guess, reintroduction or really introduction into comics mythology in Amazing Spider-Man Annual Number 5, the kind of stunning reveal that they were agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. all along. Um, and you've written, you know, a, a pretty famous modern story, you know, Spider-Man family business, dealing with this kind of uh, realm of Spider-Man's history. I guess I'm curious to ask you first, do you remember your first reaction to discovering that Peter's parents were agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. when you, when you read this comic? And I guess I'm, I just want to feel out, like your feelings about it when you first discovered it and maybe how they've changed over time, uh, just to kind of get an idea of where you uh, lay in regards to this aspect of Peter's life. Sure. I mean, I'm a big fan of it, but that's probably because I encountered it when I was five years old. So that may be it. The five, six, whatever it was the first Spider-Man comic I ever read. Oh. It was the amazing Spider-Man annual number five, where we find the secret of Peter Parker's parents. And I had not read many Marvel comics before or long after that. I lived in the Deep South, and therefore, and Marvel distribution was really spotty, so it was almost all DC comics. And I don't have any idea how I got my hands on one issue randomly of a Spider-Man annual, but I remember digging that story a lot when I was a kid. And if I had read it as an adult instead, I might have flinched a little bit more just because there's something that I, I, I I'm not sure it is the best thing for all of our characters to have relatives and, and uh, parents and so forth who are also incredibly super special. I wonder if it doesn't make the sort of the regular Peter Parker guy, you know, Peter Parker, regular guy who gets bit by Spider-Man. I don't know if that sort of colors that a little bit. It may not, but that's, you know, all this is to say that because mostly because I read it as a kid, I love that development. Now, obviously, I mean, Mark, the fact that you read this, it has such an impression on you, but like kind of looking throughout history, I mean, you have this comic in the annual, and then there was that story in the 90s where Peter's parents came back uh, and were, what, androids or something like yeah. that? Or, um, but, and then, of course, there were the two Mark Webb movies that kind of mined that um, content. Yeah, you see, that's where, that's where I think you go completely off the rails, okay. because that in those movies... Uh, Peter's parents were arguably more interesting than Peter himself. Peter's dad was more interesting than Peter himself. And and it sort of took focus off of Peter a lot. If it it also, you know, you gotta be careful. It's a, I guess it's a different animal because that take on Peter's parents made Peter's dad a little more responsible for what had happened to Peter and so forth, and it sort of took away from the origin. But still, I I my my point being making you know, making that maybe it's better if we don't go on and on and on and on and on about how amazingly spectacular Peter's parents were. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I was just going to say, I mean, do you think that's part of the reason why outside of these stories? And then, like you said, obviously the variation in the movies that it feels like the storyline, this, this element of Peter's mythology never really has truly taken off. Like it's like it kind of, it, it comes up and it gets dropped for 20, 30 years and then comes yeah. back up again. You know, I mean, is it, is it just like what you're saying? It's just, maybe at the end of the day, really shouldn't be part of the character? I mean, I what do you think? I think that's the general feeling. I think it's the general sentiment. I'm not sure I agree with it, like I said, but I, I, 
I, you know, it's the general sentiment. It's the same idea as, you know, you, you don't want to suddenly establish that Thomas Wayne, Batman's father, was actually a superhero in his own right, or that Pa Kent was actually a super secret agent on his end. And here's a bunch of stories about Pa Kent, super secret agent, because it seems to diminish the, you know, the uniqueness, the specialness of the character you're really focusing on. What do you think this reveal, I mean, when, I guess we can call it a reveal now. I don't know if it was really that hyped back in the day as, as this kind of secret to be revealed. But um, what do you think it's had, like an impact it's had on the Spider-Man character and I guess like his kind of overall arc, if you want to look at it that way? I mean, they, they do play an important role in his life in, in some regard. And yet it really doesn't seem to have any impact on why he does what he does or anything about Spider-Man on a day-to-day basis. So, I mean, it, certainly as I see it, uh, from my point of view, I just think that his parents are two strangers who he has some vague, vague memories of. But he does not I don't think he has any real emotional attachment to these people. And therefore, I don't see how that would really impact what he does on a day-to-day basis. Do you think that that's like a, a big missed opportunity? Mm-hmm. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Not necessarily. I think that we're, the nice thing about separating Peter from his parents like that, too, is you get away from the idea that Peter, that one of the reasons Peter does things is because his parents were was, were killed or because of the fate of his parents or whatever. If that becomes some of his motivation, which is a terrible, terrible idea for Spider-Man. You know, you mentioned that obviously, you know, Clark Kent and, and, and Bruce Wayne earlier. But, you know, one of the things that's always kind of distinguished Spider-Man and Peter Parker specifically is this idea that he's this everyman, even though this is an everyman right. who's fought Thanos and right. ran a Fortune 500 company and uh, has his brain swapped with Doc Ock. But, but still, at the you know, I mean, I guess, first of all, I mean, do you kind of side with that idea that he is this everyman? That, oh, yeah. You know, I mean, that's and, that's why, look, that's that's what made Marvel Comics what it was that that these are characters whose lives and problems you could relate to you know when when in the 60s when they were being created that you could understand spider-man's problem or peter parker's problems about school or about you know getting medicine for his aunt or about not having enough money for rent whereas and i say this with all the love in the world for superman you know superman's biggest problem was he couldn't figure out how to enlarge the bottle city of candor that is not a problem that i can relate to on any personal level. So that's what makes Peter such a great character. And so, so the, you know, like the, the more you add to it, like I always, let, let's look, we're backing up a little bit. You know, I always cringe when we give him money. I always cringe when we give him the hot girlfriend. I always cringe when things are going great for Peter. Cause that just doesn't sit right with me. Uh, it doesn't feel like Peter Parker. To me, it feels like the Parker luck should be playing more of a role. And so the idea that, P- that Peter is just a regular down on his luck guy is, I think, part of the appeal of Spider-Man. And most regular, sometimes down on their luck, people don't have glitzy James Bond super secret spy parents. And so it kind of distances you from the, you know, it makes him a little less relatable, if you will. You mentioned cringing at like some of those ideas, um, yeah. which, you know, I, I think everybody has a select few things that they feel like their interpretation of Peter would or wouldn't do or fits into his world or doesn't. And I've always kind of thought of it like, um, like a rubber band, you know, like there's a center that it will always bounce back to, but you can stretch it all the one way and it will pull back even harder to return to kind of average Peter stuff. And, sure. you know, I always, uh, you know, I, I, I don't really know how I feel about these parents and where they fit in, does that snap the rubber band? And that's why we not re- we don't return there very often. Like, do you feel like that fits in with the purview of this kind of character? Like, do you see the character in that kind of rubber bandish way that I described? Oh, oh, that very much so. I mean, that's frankly that's true for everybody. It's true for all comic book characters with any sort of longevity whatsoever. I mean, the the franchise characters: Superman, Batman, Fantastic Four, Iron Man, whatever. Eventually, Tony Stark is going to be back in the suit, and he's head of, uh, of you know Stark Industries. Eventually, the Fantastic Four is going to be back in the Baxter Building. Eventually, Clark Kent will be back at the Daily Planet as a newsman. Whatever you do to change that, whatever you do to upset the status quo, we all know that eventually we're going to snap back to the status quo uh, and then move back out from there. And that's not a, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. 
I really don't. I mean, I, I understand the the want and the need for your characters to grow up with you, but there's a reason why they worked really well for 30, 40, 50 years. And I'm always real skeptical of playing with the status quo with very successful characters because you don't know what you might break. Right. I mean, you think of something like Ben Riley's introduction, I think, threatened for a lot of people to really break the Spider-Man mythos. You know, it was... Right. It, I mean, it, it, the furthest we've moved to the point that they told us this guy isn't Spider-Man. Right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Military-grade horrible idea, obviously. I, mean, I think everybody <laughs> knows that. And I was... I mean, I was there at Ground Zero watching it happen, and I was just... You know, I'd be over in the corner going, maybe you shouldn't... Hey, maybe... Hey, this... <laughs> hey, mate. And it didn't make any difference. I, you know, I, I, it's, I mean, we're on a tangent now, but I remember how everybody went into the whole spider clone stuff with the best of intentions. Everyone really did because the feeling was we'd gotten too far away from who Peter is and what do we do? We can't divorce Peter and Mary Jane. So what do we do to restore the status quo? And that was the general feeling with the Spider-Man editorial group at the time. And this, you know, I obviously, in retrospect, not the best solution, but, you know, everybody, everybody, everybody tries to do things like this. And co- people in comics generally are trying to do a good job and are generally trying to service the characters and are generally trying sincerely to do what they think are good comics. So, you know, very, very, very rarely do we actually sit down and go, how do we punish the fans this month? We don't, we don't, do, we don't do that. How do we how do we screw up the Spider Man book for the next guy? We don't do that. <laughs> it should be about punishing the character. Like that's that's the real joy yeah. is how do they get out of this situation? Yeah, no again, nobody you know, look, I like I love those brief moments when Peter has something go right for him. I love those brief moments when he gets to be happier for him because those are nice. But on the whole, people don't read Spider Man to see Peter happy all the time. <laughs> it'd, be, it'd be a very boring book yes it would be a really super dull book if everything were go- coming up you know mill house all the time for peter parker <laughs> so um you suggested that like the ben riley thing was like a military grade mistake you know yeah i don't know that you know stan lee and and john ramita and everybody involved you know with the introduction of the parents you know really i don't think they had any idea of the longevity of this character necessarily um, right. Well, exactly. No, I mean, nobody does. You know, this, this, that was six years into Spider-Man's, you know, life. That, yeah. That's no one, no one dreamed that 60 years later we'd be doing Spider-Man stories. No one thought that we'd be doing Superman stories for 80 years. He's, it's a uniquely American situation. This is a uniquely American pop culture situation that these characters are created like this. There have been more stories told about Batman than about any other character in all of human history. <laughs> I mean, you know, yeah, Hercules has been around longer, but really, how many Hercules stories are there? Twelve Labors. <laughs> that's you know, that's the big one. But Batman, you got six different stories every month. Superman, you know, Spider Man, you have four or five different stories every single month. It's it's kind of incredible that they haven't completely collapsed under the weight of all that stuff. And sometimes they do. And then you got to do a fresh start or a sweeping reboot or something like that. But it's the longer I'm in this business and the longer I'm helping tell these stories, the more I just see the strain on these long-term franchise characters that you're loading story after story, after story, after story on them and trying to duplicate what came before and trying not to undo what came before. But it's, it's really hard to do that sometimes. Well, well, speaking of loading more on a character, yeah. uh, this is, uh, when you wrote, when, when you were pitching family business a few years ago, I mean, besides the fact, obviously, you know, we learned earlier that the annual number five was your first comic. So you had some sentimental attachment to it, but what, what, I guess what was part of your, your reasoning in trying to kind of go back over some of this material. I mean, was this just a story that had just been kind of kicking around in your brain for a while or what, what was kind of the genesis of that? Not really. It was editor Steve Wacker's edict, edict was do an, do an original Spider-Man graphic novel, but we need a hook. We need some hook to it that it's not just another Spider-Man story that you could just tell anywhere, uh, something big. And I sat around and I sat around and for whatever reason, 
the notion of Peter opening his door because somebody's knocking on it and he's, he opens the door and some woman steps in and says, I need your help. I'm your sister. That came to mind and I sold it to Wacker with the idea. And this gets back to, uh, you know, I, I, I don't want, you know, I would give this big speech about how I'm not sure that Peter's parents being spies is a really good thing for the character. And then I come around and do the thing with his sister. It sounds vaguely <laughs> hypocritical, but in my, in my defense, we deliberate from the get go, the, the character was deliberately designed to be ambiguous. Yeah. Always designed to be, is she, is she really, is she not? And then you can decide for yourself. And I was, I just figured we never see her again. Or I figured it'd be a while before we saw her again. I can't believe that Chip brought her back. Chip Zdarsky brought her back, but I'm very grateful that he's doing something with her. Was there any pushback in the office into waiting into, I mean, I think we're going to say this sometimes controversial element of Peter's story. I mean, that's a great pitch, the idea that his sister shows up. Was anybody like, you know, maybe we shouldn't get that, you know, not, involved? I, not, not, not really because we said we're going to leave it ambiguous at the end. Sure. You know, it, it, we would obviously clearly a much harder pushback if we'd said, okay, this is something that we're going to carve in stone. Right. And yet, like, you've also over the years, you know, you know, during like Brand New Day as well, like, you, you've, you've always had this, you've, you've had this knack of introducing new characters into kind of Peter's circle. I mean, either with Jay Jameson, now of course, Teresa, uh, Teresa Parker. Yeah. I mean, so how, how, how did you handle creating these characters in a way that, you know, you kind of toe the line between not significantly altering the fundamentals of who uh, Peter is and their origins, but, uh, you know, but also, you know, adding to this universe and to this circle a bit, you know? It's really tricky. It's really a very difficult thing to do, which, and we're going to go off on another tangent here for a second, <laughs> which is a reason why, whether you like it or not, whether you think it was a good idea or not, whether it backfired or not, which is why a lot of, you know, Captain America, Iron Man, Thor fans were kind of disappointed in the last two or three years because we introduced new legacy characters to fit those those suits because there's it's very, very difficult just to bring everybody everybody's retort to that is we'll just just introduce new characters and make them good and people will love them. That's not how it works. Sadly, that's not how it works. The comics history is littered with the corpses of really good characters that nobody cared about. So it is hard to do that. It's, and, and the fact that you create something that sticks is not so much. Well, I mean, it's you know, here. This is true of both J. Jonah Jameson Sr. and Teresa Parker. Uh, they were both created by me with the notion that this is neat. And if nobody ever does anything with them forever and ever, that's OK. I got to do something cool. And the fact that they were then later used by other writers is awesome because that means you got to put something back into the toy box that, you know, you got to introduce something new that had some legs and it feels like you're able to contri contribute something to the, to the mythos. But I honestly didn't sit down and go, okay, here's my long-term plan for J Jonah Jameson senior. It was really just a joke. It was Tom Pyre and I were talking and I think Tom Pyre had the joke of J Jonah Jameson senior. And I ran with that. Um, and, and that it went anywhere is, isn't because of any grand design on my part. It just, it worked out because some other writer liked the character and said, Hey, maybe there's something here. It makes it kind of weird for you because you've kind of in, invented these ambiguous characters in, in some way, intentionally. So with Teresa Parker, who now it seems is officially Peter's sister. So you're, you're kind of credited in some way with creating Peter's sister, even though that wasn't necessarily your intention. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> Well, you know, the, again, the characters take on a life of their own, though. You can't, yeah. you know, you, you, you can't be blamed for what people do with the characters you create. Well, you mentioned before um, this idea that it can be problematic to begin to upgrade all of a character's supporting cast, whether it's involving them directly in superheroics in a way that's more than just kind of being along for the ride to having powers or having a Venom symbiote or you know, y you name it. Um, and I think, you know, Spider-Man's cast, if you look at it, it's like Flash became Venom for a while. And, you know, like literally every character, I would say maybe other than like Betty and Jonah have have kind of been upgraded in some way. I guess Aunt May, maybe not. Although she did get the power cosmic briefly. Right. right. Um, 
I guess I, I'd love to know more about kind of your approach to, I mean, you've created, a, you know, written a lot of comics with great supporting casts. And I guess I'm curious about your approach to balancing that and like how you think it should be maintained because ultimately you want to do something with these characters and there is an appeal to, you know, upgrading them in some way that could be like kind of sexy and, and sell comics and bring them into the world in a more interesting way, but it could do lasting damage long term to that character really working. Like really Flash Thompson kind of had to be killed in issue 800 because how do you bring him back down from that in some way? No, that's true. That's a really dangerous. Once you open that door, it is hard to close it. This is, you know, my, as much as I love the Arrowverse shows on the CW, and I really do, my only complaint is, Jesus, God, why is everyone a superhero? Yeah. Why does everyone have to eventually end up being a superhero? You know, I'm Supergirl's maid. I am, I am also a superhero, it turns out. that that <laughs> you, That's way too far. And I... I agree exactly with what you just said, that it's unfortunately the temptation there with a lot of established, oh, established supporting characters is, hey, this guy's been around a while and maybe maybe we could do something. Maybe he should be the new carnage or something like that. And it, it's a short term burst of interest for that character. But sometimes it's not the best idea because, like you said, it, it wrecks the character. For, you can't you, know, you can't go back. You can't ever go back and 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 do anything with that character in the tradition that we know him. There's also kind of this desire to create like, like characters. And, and I like a lot of these characters, but you know, we've recently gotten into the realms of um, like two people were bitten by, you know, the spider that bit Peter Parker. Right. And as much as you like, you might like silk, you know, it, it does. I don't say it, I think it lessens Peter in any way, but it, it, it strains credulity. You know, I, I even think about, like, uh, issue 800 of Amazing Spider-Man. I'm not sure if you've read it, but, like, you've got this funeral scene at the end for Flash Thompson, and everybody there has been touched by it in some way, and you wonder, how is Aunt May completely, uh, like, uh, clueless to all the yeah. things going on around her? Uh, I guess yeah. I'm, I'm more curious about the light characters. Do you, like, is there a certain point where you think creating so many similarly powered people in that universe you know batman's got a team of 20 other bat characters does that eventually like hurt batman in a way or is it all additive i don't know i think it to be honest i think it depends on the character and i know that sounds like a wishy-washy answer but i the art i mean the, the let me put it this way the standing argument the general consensus the general wisdom about this is that yes it destroys the characters because you know you only want one batman you only want one superman you only want one spider-man or, or captain america whatever and that's probably true but that said you know with if that were a stone you know a stone cold rule we'd never have supergirl and supergirl's turned out to be a very very interesting character on her own you know if if that were not if that were a stone cold rule then we would never have a batwoman we would never have had a batgirl barbara gordon would never have been batgirl for any length of time so it depends on the character it's a case by case basis i know that is a really non committal answer but that's my answer well what do you think about spider-man uh, you know for this very specifically topic show i'm i it i don't want to i i i like Peter's personally like Peter's origin to be very unique. And I like it to be a random act of chance rather than some sort of spider totem nonsense. Boy, the Moreland stuff made me just want to jump off a bridge uh, <laughs> back in the day. Cause that the idea that Spider-Man is some long, <laughs> long tradition of spider champions or whatever. And he's, He's with the Spider Force, and he's, he's using the Spider Force, and he's got Max Mercury. Oh, I'm sorry, I meant Moreland. He's <laughs> that seems a lot to me. It's Superman. Spider Man doesn't have to be a legacy character. Also left ambiguous ultimately until it was resurfaced and made concrete. Yeah, <laughs> better to leave that stuff ambiguous. Better because here's the thing, and this let's let's get back to you know one of the whenever you to, whenever I talk about Spider Man. And whenever you talk about the history of Spider-Man, obviously the big elephant in the room is always going to be there are people who think Peter should have been married to Mary Jane. There are people who think Peter shouldn't be married to Mary Jane. And 
as much as I want to say from my point of view, I don't think they should be married. I understand fully that for like what, 20 something years, right? They were married in the comics. That's the Peter that a lot of our fans grew up reading. That's their Peter Parker. I get that. It would be, it would be hypocritical of me not to acknowledge that they have every right to want that of their Spider-Man the same way that it would be hypocritical of me to, 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 to dismiss their love for that and yet write Wally West, the Flash, as if that were okay. I mean, because really they're the same, it's the same idea, right? Yeah. That, that you know, if, if I'm going to play by those rules that Peter should never been married and it's stupid that Peter was married and you're, you're stupid because you think Peter should be married, then Barry Allen should always have been the Flash and Wally should not have been. Uh, you can't have one without the other. It's, it's always going to be somebody's... Spider-Man, that's the thing about these characters being around for so long, also, is that, you know, some slice of that character's life is always going to be the golden age of somebody's comic book fandom. There's a huge number of people out there who, to whom the Spider-Clone stuff was great. They loved it. They loved Ben Riley. They loved Scarlet Spider. And so, because that's when they were reading Spider-Man, and that's when they were loving Spider-Man the most, growing up. I get that. You have to, you know, you have to give props to that. It's it's hard to. I know we're way off on a tangent, but the, <laughs> but really, we're coming back to stuff we talked about earlier on when you were asking original questions about status quo and about what to do with these characters, about moving them past certain points or, or what have you. And like I said, my personal philosophy, and this is not an edict. This is not a this is not a a thing that I think should be a law in comics. It's my own personal take is when I take on these characters who have been around for longer than I have I take on these characters who have been around since before I was born my feeling is uh, that you want to try to go back to ground as best you can because something worked about that there's a reason these characters lasted 40, 50, 60, 70 years and if you think you know the magic combination of elements that made them last then you're an idiot because you don't. I mean, you're, then you're an egotistical maniac because you don't. Nobody. If we, if I knew the magic formula to make a character last sixty years, I'd be creating characters tomorrow that would last sixty years. No one's doing that. You, you don't know what the alchemy is. You don't know what the special things about Wonder Woman are that you can change and the things you can't change. Uh, you know, make any sense? You buying what I'm saying so far? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean, you never, yeah, right. You know, and then was, and again with Spider Man, same thing. You never know what you're gonna, what you can change, and it's still Spider Man, and what you can't change, and it screws it up. And so, my own personal feeling is, don't go, don't do something irreversible that's gonna break one of the one of the givens about the character. But that's me. That said, I I don't want people who love Mary Jane Parker to come after me with torches and pitchforks because I get that they love that wrinkle. And I am sorry that for them, that that is no longer a part of their Spider-Man continuity, but it's, I understand why we put that genie back in the bottle. Well, with all that being said, and after you, you, you kind of balanced the whole issue of status quo. So, so well, I, I do feel compelled to ask you, Mark, um, yeah. if, you, if you could go back, I mean, going back to Peter's parents specifically, if we could, yeah. If you could go back and re, you know, redo it a la Bendis and Ultimate Spider-Man, kind of, you know, redo the origin stories and whatnot. I mean, what, where, what do you, what do you think should be this the situation with Peter's parents? Should they be more grounded? Uh, you know, is that work you feel more to the core of the character if it could be redone? Or I mean, do do we keep elements of this? Of I, think, the, of this? I think I think if I were going back and waving a magic wand, I think you'd leave it like it is because I don't think it's really hurt Peter. I think, I think it's been more additive than subtractive because it never comes up. You know, it shows <laughs> up every, every 10, 15 years. Somebody does a story about Peter's parents. It's, it's not like every month we're doing another callback to it. Um, and therefore, you know, I mean, how – let's use – I mean, can you use Bendis? Let's use Miles as an, ex- as an example. Let's use uh, – or, or let's use Peter as an example. His, her, his Peter, his, the ultimate Spider-Man, much more – connected to shield much more connected to his parents legacy 
and that made for some great stories and Bendis did great stuff with it. Uh, but I would argue that that made ultimate Peter Parker feel a little less like you and me than mainstream Marvel Peter Parker. My two cents. And like you said, for every person that loves Mary Jane or the 90s clone stuff, there's someone like you who loved reading Annual Number 5 when they were a kid. Right, exactly. Excellent. Mark, Mark, I mean, thank you again so much. I mean, obviously, I mean, we, we, we all read your books, but I mean, where, where, where can we find you currently? Do you want to, uh, you know, promote any you know, social media or anything like that to, to find you on or, you know, have at it. This is, this is, it's, it's your big moment. <laughs> sure. Well, I am currently, currently in Marvel, I'm doing Ant-Man and the Wasp and I'm doing Dr. Strange and having a great time with those. Uh, I'm doing a lot of other creator owned stuff that is percolating for later this year, early next, and uh, some other stuff at Marvel that we can't really announce yet online. You can find me at markwade.com. There's a fans of Mark Wade Facebook page. Uh, there's also a Mark Wade personal page, but we're phasing that out to move it over into the, the fans page because you get with on the personal page, you have that 5,000 friend limit, you know, that we want to yeah. try to, you know, get rid of. So, uh, there's that, uh, and that's basically where you can find me. Well, awesome. Thanks again for, uh, taking the time to join us. No, my pleasure. Absolutely. Well, once again, I'd like to thank Mark Wade for joining us on the show. Um, he provided a lot of insight into, I guess, not only his creative process uh, for Spider-Man, but like comics in general, and also, you know, how creators often handle things like this, you know, even non-controversial changes to characters' backstories or expanding their supporting cast. So thanks again, uh, Mark Wade. It means a lot that you would take the time to join us. Yes, and of course, Dan, you and I actually talked about Spider-Man Family Business on this great podcast back in 2014. So uh, I recommend probably in your show notes here uh, checking that episode out. It was also a recent episode of Untold Talks of Spider-Man. So many places to find family business, Dan. Absolutely. And our, and our, our, our mighty podcast team discussing it. And Amazing Spider-Man Annual Number 5 is not one of our essentials. <laughs> I, I think it's safe to say. It, it is not, although I did do a post on Chasing the Amazing about it back when I bought it a couple of years ago because, you know, I think I basically did it to troll you. Uh, <laughs> like, I, like I do. Yeah. Uh, anyway, and so thanks to all of you for joining us for this 11th episode of the second season of the all-new Amazing Spider Talk where we did talk about an annual. Uh, Dan, our next episode will be out in a couple of weeks. And what is the title of that show? Yeah, it's going to be called Goodbye, Spider Dad. Uh, it's going to be our discussion all about Stan Lee's exit from his role as the main writer of Amazing Spider-Man with issue 100. And I think it'll also be a really good time for you and I to talk about Stan's legacy on the title. I know we've talked about him as a writer and his importance before, but it'll be a good time to kind of revisit that conversation as we're saying goodbye to him and and talk about what his transition process away was like, where he hired probably the most unexpected choice to pick over the book um, that will kind of bridge us into uh, the end of the season and our look towards season three. Absolutely. And uh, for our Patreon subscribers, be sure to check out our Patreon page and your podcast feed this week for a special review of Amazing Spider-Man number two or Legacy numbering 803. Uh, as well as a roundup review of all of July's B-Title books. Uh, there's no better place to join on the Patreon bandwagon than to join us for our exciting coverage of this new run. Remember, for just $3.99 a month, the price of a new comic, you'll get access to our exclusive new issue reviews, swarm B-Book reviews, extended interviews, mailbags, and more. And for $10 or more a month, you'll get access to some awesome commission artwork, uh, this one is going to be from none other than the great Alex Saviak. What else we got, Dan? Well, actually, I posted the preview uh, of Alex Saviak's uh, pencils and inks for that commission in our uh, Patreon-only Spider Slack. So if you are curious and you are a Patreon member, what that you know commission is starting to look like, go check that out, and I think you'll be pretty thrilled by how it's come together. 
But you can also check out the Untold Talks of Spider-Man, as we said before. But recently, they discussed a Spider-Man and Sentry crossover title. Talk about random. But actually not, because the Sentry just returned to the Marvel Universe after a long time away. So if you want to use Spider-Man as an entry point into learning more about the Sentry and the Void and all that complications, go check it out there. And plus, we've got the amazing Spider Slack community, as I said before, for you to join, where we're talking about Spider-Man every day, every hour of every day. It's just a lot of Spider-Man, people sharing their pictures from conventions and all kinds of stuff. So go check it out. There's a link in our episode description for you to join. And then lastly, we said at the top of the show, don't forget to give us a ring at 9 Red Goblin. The the phone line definitely named after a character Dan Slot didn't take from us and then turn into a final part of his run. And you can, you know, if you're calling in, you can leave us your name, where you're calling from, and a message to be played on our 200th episode of the show. Absolutely. I can't wait to hear what you guys uh, call in and say. So, Dan, um, while we're waiting for those phone calls, uh, where can we find you on the social medias? Yeah, um, I'm on social media, particularly on Twitter, at, at SUP Spider Talk, where I'm kind of breaking down all the new issues of Spider-Man coming out and finding little hidden details um, that Mark, you and I are going to discuss in our Patreon review episodes of of those comics. So um, if you kind of want to get a little bit of an insight into what I thought about modern Spider-Man comics, go check me out there. What about you, Mark? Oh, well, of course, you can find me on Twitter at ASM blog. And uh, my book, my book, buy my book, 100 Things Spider-Man Fans Should Know and Do Before They Die. Mark, I set up a communique to start tapping into kind of World War II Nazi signals that still remain strong 70 years later. I don't know if they're being boosted by something within our country, but you know, you never know. Um, right. But uh, anyway, so I turned on this signal boost, and I actually uh, discovered a long-lost communique sent out by Peter's parents. And, uh, you know, I found it really stirring, which is why I shared it with you. Do you want to share it with our listeners? Yeah, when you sent this to me, Dan, it really warmed the cockles of my heart. Because you know what it said? Well, of course you did. You sent it to me. It said, with great podcasts must also come the all-new Amazing Spider Talk. Don't, don't miss the next installment. Don't, 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 don't,